But you know what? You might have listened to this. You might have read along and thought, why on earth is he reading this in detail? But, do you know what? This is actually really exciting stuff. You don't believe me, I know. I know the truth. You're thinking I'm nuts. But actually, this, despite the fact that it's really hard to understand a chapter about desolation and waste and dead body, it actually, and the two chapters that follow, are among some of the most exciting chapters, I think, in the whole scripture. I'm going to prove it to you. I know it's hard to understand. It's really tough to get. And sometimes we read a chapter like this, and, it, and, we, and we may totally misunderstand the whole purpose of it, and that's the problem. There was an older gentleman many years ago who was on an airplane for the first time. And uh, they were going high over the Rockies, and the stewardess seen that he was uh, a little nervous and obviously was flying for the first time and was a little bit uncomfortable, came to him and, and kind of slid him a piece of gum. He said, chew on this, it's going to help your ears. Okay, he said, thank you. And after, you know, a little time went by, and they were coming down and getting ready to land. He, he kind of waved over at the stewardess. Wait, miss? He says, do you know, when I get off the plane, I'm meeting my wife right away, right away and she's not going to be happy about this gum in my ear. How do I get it out? <laughs> it's easy to misunderstand things. Ezekiel, I'm calling this sermon series Pathways because the people are in real trouble. They have, they have this feeling that under the best case scenario, they'd be rejected by God, and under the worst case scenario, God is not powerful enough to protect them. And Ezekiel comes along and he's confronted by a giant chariot and given a job to do, and he comes with these messages for the people of Israel, and he says, among other things, take responsibility for yourself. You're in trouble, understand, because you have made mistakes, and those around you make mistakes. Take responsibility for your actions. Understand that you are a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. There is nothing you can do to save yourself or those around you, but is there hope? Is there hope? We're certainly going to find the hope today. And that's what this is so exciting about. Mount Seir is dead. Why on earth am I excited? I have, in the time that I've been in Viking, I figure, I was kind of thinking about this week, I figure I've done about 30 or so sermon series. And occasionally I'm asked about which ones are the most interesting and favorite ones I've done. And the most interesting sermon series I have ever done, at least for me in my studies, was one I did about, I think about six years ago, through the, through the fall months. And it was on one that started, there was Abraham in the Old Testament. And the people of the entire world are in trouble. And God comes down to Abraham and he gives him a great promise that salvation is coming and you are the ancestor of salvation. You are the light to the world. And that promise of hope gets passed from Abraham down to his son Isaac, and Isaac passes it down to his son Esau. Now Esau was a big, strong, independent guy. He had little need for such a promise from God. He had little need from a Savior from heaven, because he was a strong, independent man. And so, he sold that promise to his younger brother, for a bowl of stew. What contempt for the promise of God that he would sell it for a bowl of stew. The younger brother, there was little to admire in him. He was a weaselly type of fellow. He was not admired by anyone. But boy, did he need that promise. Boy, did he need that Savior. 
I've often heard people talk about, oh yeah, you look at the Arabs and the Jews fighting, it goes right back to the earliest days of history, and there's a lot of truth in that. But if you go through the biblical history, the Bible's emphasis is not the fight between uh, Isaac's brother Ishmael and, and, his, and Isaac and, and the Arabs and the Jews and all that. The focus of the Bible is the fight between the sons of Esau and the sons of Jacob. And we find over and over again throughout the scriptures, almost every book of the Bible from Genesis up until the book of Acts, it kind of stops there, from Genesis to Acts, we find over and over again this battle between the sons of Esau, who have no need for God, and the children of Jacob, who have a desperate need for God. And the sons of Esau are known by a whole bunch of different names. You can find them called uh, Amalekites. You can find them called Edomites. Here they're called Mount Seir, which is one of the, the central parts of their location. And God is continually coming along to the, his children, to the sons of Jacob, saying, I want you to wipe those folks out. The Amalekites, I want them gone. The Edomites, I want them gone. Wipe them out. And the children of Israel keep finding some excuse for not wiping them. They'll, they'll battle them. They'll knock them down. They'll fight them a little bit. They'll win a little victory, but they won't finish the job. One of the great examples is one of the early kings of Israel, King Saul, who gets into this battle with the Amalekites, and God says, I want them gone. And he goes and he attacks them, he beats them real bad, but he decides to keep part of them. Because there's something salvageable there. There's something good. There's some riches. There's a good king. There's things that I can salvage for the glory of God. And so he disobeys. And in the end, Saul is killed by an Amalekite. They do him in. It goes right through into the New Testament. All these folks we find called Herods in the New Testament. They're all called by the same first name. They're all sons of Esau. They couldn't get rid of them. They tried. They just never could. And the amazing thing about this is this. When I did that sermon series all these years, and we did this, this is me doing a whole four-month sermon series in five months. But we did that, we found that it was a parallel between this battle between the independent sons of Esau and the God-dependent sons of Jacob and our own spiritual lives. Because within us we have a nature, a human nature, a sinful nature that is independent of God, doesn't need Him. And we have a spiritual nature that needs God, that knows it needs God, and they're, they battle each other. But somehow we always think there's something salvageable about that human nature. We keep something of it. We hold on to it because maybe there's something good in it. And yeah, we'll battle against it and we'll win some victories and we'll feel pretty good about ourselves, but we never get rid of it. Then we come to this promise. I will make Mount Seir a waste and a desolation, and I will cut off from it all who come and go. All of a sudden, God is not saying to Israel, I want you to beat them. I want you to wipe them out. Now he's saying, I will do it. Do you know what? If I tell you to stop sinning, you won't do it. You can't. It's just, it's not part of who we are. We always find something solid. But God comes along and says, you know what? I don't want you to try your best. I want you to look to me who can do it. I don't want you to think that you can just all of a sudden become great because I can become great for you. The last in the biblical line of Esau, at least the last one we find mentioned in the Bible, was a guy by the name of Herod. It was one of several, as I said. He was king. He was over all the Jewish people. And he had this complex that I'm kind of godlike. I'm pretty important. 
And he goes up in front of the people, and God snaps his fingers, and Herod falls over dead. God gets rid of him. That's the way that it truly is with our sinful nature. We need to understand that we may fail, but that's not the point. Because people who fail are looking for that pathway out. And we need to see that God is powerful. That when we take responsibilities for our failure, we can look to God alone for success. Chapter 36, the chapter that follows, kind of explains this a little bit. So I'm going to hit on some of the main verses. I'm going to put them up on the screen. Ezekiel 36. Aha! That's a great way to start, isn't it? The ancient heights have become our possession. Therefore prophesy and said, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Because they ravaged and crushed you from every side, so that you became the possession of the rest of the nations, and the object of people's malicious talk and slander. I'm going to stop there. I know, despite the fact there's a period, that's a mid-sentence. But they've lost. This is talking about the people of God. They, they, they went in battle. They went up against the people of Mount Seir, and they lost. I mean, they won some victories, but along the way, overall, they lost. You fought the fight, you've lost. You went out, you tried to battle, you were not strong enough. Do you know what? It's time to look for help outside of yourself. A few verses later. Surely I've spoken in my hot jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all Edom, who gave my land to themselves as a possession, with wholehearted joy and utter contempt, that they may make its pasture lands a prey. It's an interesting word, that jealousy. We often find it describing God. Not jealous in an immature or an insecure type of way, but jealous in the sense of being unwilling to share loyalties. In fact, there's no room to share loyalties. Many things can pull our attention away from God, and do you know what? God wants your whole attention. It's really kind of the, the crux of the last sermon series I preach captivated. There are a whole <coughs> lot of stuff out there that we can cling to and want to see. And when we talk about this human nature, it's very natural for us. This sinful nature is what we are born into. And to move past it is unnatural. It really is. We need to keep loyal to God so that he can help us to grow. The next several verses are about the destruction and conquest that will occur because God, in his holy jealousy, in our lives, can get rid of what needs to get rid of them. We get a reminder that, Son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. A reminder, do not blame, by the way, anybody else for your mistakes. You make mistakes. Keep coming back to this. Understand that the root of all this belongs to nobody but you. God is here as Savior to help us. And then we come to a really critical verse. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things. But for the sake of my holy name, which you profaned among the nations where you've gone. And you say, why is that profound? Understand that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come into your life. I'm going to bring you to salvation. I'm going to help you in your life. I'm going to help you move past the sinful nature that you need to move past. But understand this, why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because of who I am as God. Not not because you are good enough. Not because you're smart enough. Not because you've done something to earn this. Understand, I'm coming to you before you've done anything good. I'm coming in love. Last week, we had uh, some special guests who were talking about um, their struggles with drug and alcohol abuse and the program that they were going through to, uh, to find God to, despite what they were going through. And the comment was made, 
the what a remarkable thing that God came to them as addicts, not that God came to them after they had cleaned up. I love that. What a remarkable thing. You know, I don't have to be the smartest one around. I don't have to be the best. God doesn't even look for the best or the smartest. He's looking for me. And God comes to me. Just like he comes to everyone else. And my salvation's there not because I've done something good enough, but because God's already good enough. God's, in fact, God isn't looking for my independence. That was the problem with Esau. He was already good enough. He didn't need God. He didn't need a Savior. I do. And God comes to that one. It says, yeah, you have a human nature. It will not let go. It's okay. Come to me. Come to Jesus. Oh, his love. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. It should be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, from all your idols. Take us out of condemnation. Gather us together with people of God. Gets the dirt out, cleans us up, and then continues by saying, I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Do you know what? You cannot do it on your own. The whole point of the Old Testament shows us that we're not good enough on our own. God comes along and he gives the law and says, obey it. He comes along and says, get rid of this sinful nature. No, it doesn't work. But, but then Jesus comes. Then Jesus comes. Whenever we think we're good enough, those, those nasty sons of Esau, the Amalekites, the Edomites, and all those folks, they, 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 there's things that come along that pull us away. And the Old Testament shows us it's impossible to be perfect. It's impossible to be perfect. It's not going to happen. But the need to be perfect is replaced by Jesus. Forgiveness and then a change of heart. And the Holy Spirit being invited into our lives to impact us. To enable us to live the way we should. God comes into our lives and says, you're, you're not good enough yet, but you know what's okay? I'm going to come into your life, I'm going to change how it is, and you will live differently because I was there. You will be different, but not because you try harder. You'll be different because of the presence of my Spirit in you, that I change you. And when you look and rely on the Spirit of God and let Him fill you and not rely on the human nature, that's when we can be different. Which leads to promises. I'll make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. God will bring hope. Thus says the Lord God, this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them, to increase their people like a flock. I love that phrase in there. This, this is a gift. I will let the house of Israel do what? I will let them ask me. See, we have a God who doesn't force us. If you're independent like Esau, God, God isn't going to force himself upon you. You have a choice. But he does allow us to have the opportunity to ask him. Sinned? Need help? Ask for it. Come before him seeking forgiveness. Seeking his acceptance. What a great thing. We can turn from ourselves and turn to God. Chapter 13.
37 then goes on to tell two stories. I'm going to do them very shortly. First one's actually kind of a famous story. The only thing famous out of the book of Ezekiel, and it's a story about Ezekiel, whether in dream or whether in reality, goes down into a valley, sees skeletons all over the place. And God asks him, well, can they live? And Ezekiel gives a very wise answer. He says, well, you're God. You know I don't. Probably the right answer. And God says, well, tell them. Tell me what flesh back on their bones. And he says, okay, flesh back on your bones. And there's flesh on their bones. And then God says, well, okay, now we're just left with a whole lot of corpses. Can these corpses be brought back to life? Ezekiel again says, uh, I don't know, God, what do you think? He says, I want you to talk to the wind and tell the wind to blow into their bodies. And that's exactly what happens. And these corpses come to life and it's described as a great army. There's a second story, though. And the second story has to do with two sticks. And it isn't quite as dramatic a story, I'll tell you. But still. It's a good story. Ezekiel is told, I well, want you to get two sticks. And so he goes gets two sticks. And I want you to write on the sticks the names of two different parts of Israel because the Jewish people have been separated. They were in difficulty. They weren't getting along. And this has been going back for centuries. And God says to so him, I want you to write the names of the two parts of Israel on these two sticks. And then I want you to hold them together. So it looks like it's one stick. He says, okay. He does it. He says, why? He says, because this is reconciliation. This is re result, is reconciliation. You know what? God gets a hold of our lives. He's saying there are two results. Number one, life. It's a good start. Number two, Reconciliation, both between us and God and with other people. Hold it together so it looks like one's reconciliation. And then God finishes that chapter by saying this. Just listen to these words. I didn't put this up on the screen. I want you to listen. My servant David shall be king over them. Now, King David was somebody who lived centuries before. It's talking about the literal King David. No, it's talking about his heir, Jesus. And they shall have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their land and multiply them. And will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place shall be with them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel. And my sanctuary is in their midst forever. A lot of forevers in here. God doesn't go back on his promises. Bottom line says Failed? Okay. We have a new way. God comes along and says, I will win it for you. I will bring new life. I will bring reconciliation. You know what? You can do two things in life. You can choose to try your best in everything, be a bit of a perfectionist. Or you come to Jesus. And Jesus says, I have a pathway. The difficulty is it's not found by trying real hard to find your own path. It's by following Jesus. We don't just try to kill the sinful nature, we come to Jesus. <coughs> and we forever and continually commit ourselves again to Jesus. That's how it ends here. The King David is going to come. And it's, not. it's David who was a human. It's his heir, Jesus. And he comes to us, and he brings us his promise that forever I will be your God. I will live with you forever. I will be with you. 
for all eternity, from the day that you bring some, come to him in salvation to the day that will never come where eternity ends. I will be with you. I will live with you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. And forever we will be with that God. And that is our hope. And we don't just try our best. We understand that our best is not what God is after. Because our best is never enough. Instead, we come to Jesus. We learn to love Jesus. We learn to be loved by Jesus. And what great hope there is in that. God does a great transformation. I invite our worship team.